so let's try let's try to start uh, we are already 10 minutes late so even if people are still trying to find a room and and uh, so on uh, I would like to to thank you to to come to this uh, to to this first actually side event uh, of this week we propose this title the role of research and innovation in the Eurogeos regional initiative uh, I'm Jean Mazo, I work in uh, CREAF in a research group. Uh, CREAF is a Barcelona Research Center in a research group that is called Grumets. And uh, I'm working on some projects uh, which laws out there. And I apologize because I forgot about Terra Planet and I didn't put it there. So I'm always doing this, uh, forgetting things. Uh, so I. When I was trying to prepare this session, I was wondering what to do, uh, and uh, I had the alternative of uh, uh, of uh, preparing a very formal session with uh, you know people at the speak and uh, then questions, uh, normal format. But I thought, you know, come on, it's eight o'clock in the morning. People are just arriving. Uh, they they probably are in a jet lag. Uh, <laughs> so instead of instead of doing that, let's let's just try to be imaginative. And uh, when you are imaginative, you risk things. Uh, so I propose a different format. Let's just start saying that uh, we have heard about uh, this idea of Eurogeos. Uh, it is uh, one of the regional initiatives of. Uh, of GEOs, of course, uh, Africa GEOs, uh, America GEOs, Asia Pacific GEOs, and now Euro GEOs. So, what what is uh, uh, Euro GEOs? Uh, so, sorry because I I will not say what is because there is a launching event just by the end of the of, of the day, and uh, they will tell you everything about that. But even if I will not say anything. Uh, uh, we have an intuition of what should be, so we can still speak even if we don't know exactly what, about what. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you, you want to say some some words uh, about it, or, or we just go ahead and see. <laughs> Please. Uh, I believe it's better that you come to to use one of these mics just for the people in the in the streaming. <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody. So I'm Marianne van Mello, I work for the European Commission. And this afternoon we're going to have the launch event of the Eurogeos Initiative. It's already been sort of out there in concept and so on, so that's why we're talking about it here. But the official launch will be this afternoon. Um, the DG of research is going to be there, he's also the lead co-chair. He's going to give some welcome words and then um, Jack Matt is going to give a presentation about the concept. We will have something about Eurogeos and Copernicus there. And then we have a couple of examples. Um, one of them by Jerry Rosian, who is also here. We have Pierre Defini and we have Max Craglia. So I invite you all to come here. It's also in this room, so I hope you have enough, uh, enough space to fit everybody in. But please come here. It's at uh, 4.30. So thank you. Thank you, John. Yes, you're welcome. There is also another event related with uh, Eurogeos here, here just after this one. And this is the one that are organizing the research infrastructures that uh, you will lead, I believe. Uh, so please, th this is not the, the last time that you are going to, to hear all this, of course. This is just the beginning. Uh, so when the, when the issue of the Eurogeos was presented and I read the first drafts, I had the kind of a feeling that uh, the intention of the Commission was to consolidate what was already there. Instead of in, in pushing new things or going uh, forward on, on or, or even beyond in some aspects. And I thought maybe uh, from the research point of view we can still say something uh, about geos and, uh, and the e European perspective on that. So I wanted to discuss with you uh, which are these innovative things that we still believe that uh, Eurogeos need, that we can accumulate to the, to the things that we have been doing for uh, several years now. 
the format is very simple. We are going to structure this discussion it's in three blocks. The first block, we are uh, going to talk about the potential of the current uh, European data products. In the second block, we are going to talk about uh, analytics and visualization of data. And the third block, we are going to talk about data management in general. So uh, for each blog, I will propose a less than 10 minutes video, except the first one, and it's a little bit longer, for inspiration. And then the, I will ask everybody to participate in a 20 minute discussion related to the topic video uh, and the general framework uh, of these discussions today. I will propose some initial questions to start, but uh, you can, you can divert from from those, of course, with new additions. And I will try to record the possible uh, discussions and actions that emerge from from this discussion. So let's let's go ahead with the with the first video. Uh, it is uh, for the inspiration of this topic, combined use of cross-disciplinary data sets to showcase the power of geos and geos in particular. So the, the video is uh, uh, about the global surface water. Uh, Alan Lebward, that actually is here, I saw him uh, this morning. He's not here in this room, but he's here in this building, I mean. He's in the other room. <laughs> <in the> room. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's presenting that, that video. It is explaining everything uh, about uh, the, the use of uh, and the goods and bads of this uh, global data set, and the, in particular about the changes uh, that we are doing in the environment and condition, how the, surfi the surface water shapes are uh, changing. So it is talking about uh, data set series that starts in uh, 1984 uh, to the day and uh, is done in a TED uh, format uh, conference. So, okay, so let me go and try and start the video. To do that, I need a mouse, and I don't see anyone in my screen, because it's in the other screen. OK, now it's in my screen. Uh, this is the first one. Pim, pim. And uh, now I probably should move it here, maybe. Mapping the world's most precious resource. And, uh, because that immediately poses the question, what is the world's most precious resource? And I'm guessing for some of you it might be gold or diamonds, and uh, for some of you it might be oil or, or gas, maybe. But in fact, for every one of you, in fact, never mind every one of you, every living thing, it's water. No water, no life. Now we know that most of the world's water is actually stored in the oceans and then some of it's stored in the clouds and in snow and in ice and some of it's under the planet's surface and some of it's actually in you as well. Um, but less than one in a thousand litres sits in the lakes and the rivers and the wetlands on the land which is where we live. And so that makes it incredibly important because it means if we want something to drink we don't need to dig a well. It's there. Because it sits on the planet's surface, it also affects the climate. And it affects the movement of animals and agriculture. And it affects transport and biodiversity. It affects energy production. It affects culture. Think of a, a house with a view of a lake and a house without a view of a lake. <laughs> uh, sadly, it also affects the movement of pollution and toxin and diseases. So, because of its importance, you would think that we knew where every last drop of it was, but we don't. In fact, all the maps that we have of water are wrong some of the time. And some of the maps that we have are wrong all of the time. And the common thing there is time. We know that water flows and water moves, but in fact, water bodies change too. Lakes dry up. When we down a river, we create a new lake. It was land, now it's a lake. 
rivers meander and move, and we create new rivers as well. We call them canals, but effectively we created an artificial river. So over the years, what is drawn the map and what is really there is different. And then even within a single year, things change. As the wet season comes, wetlands form. As the summer season comes, melt ponds form. As the growing season comes, the farmers flood the fields. So even within a year, water changes. So if we can run at this, ideally, we'd have a time machine. But we don't have a time machine. We do have satellites. And we have satellites like this one that the United States Geological Survey, which is an awful mouthful, so we say USGS, have been flying for many, many years. Now, not only have they been flying them for years, and these things take a picture of the planet's surface every 16 days. They've been keeping the pictures, archiving them, and also making them freely available. So that someone like Larry can go back in time, and we can look at what the lakes in the Alps or the Alps are like in 1985. So I'll set up pictures like this, vegetation looks green, clouds are white, um, towns and, and bare soil is, is the brown color, and the water appears black. Because I have my time machine, I can jump forward 30 years as well. And I can look at the change. Well, not much has actually changed in terms of the water here. Lake Majori was here 10,000 years ago, uh, and it hasn't changed much in the interim. Some years it does. When it's a very, very wet year, then the lake will expand ever so slightly. And that can have a massive impact if you happen to be living in that little bit of land that's usually land but is now underwater. So it will affect you personally. On the global scale, not such a big impact. But that's not the case globally. If we go to the Amazon forest now, we're looking at the same sort of area. It's about nearly 200 kilometers across that picture. Same as before. Um, what we can see there is one river coming across the, the, the main body of the, of the image, and we can see one road. Then, in the middle of the 1980s, a dam is starting to be built. They've cleaned all the forest out, building a dam to build a hydroelectric power station. Close the dam, and the river starts turning into a lake. And it fills, and it fills, and it fills. And over the space of two years, we flood two and a half thousand square kilometers of forest. Used to be forest, now it's lake. If you want to see, that continues for the next 30 years. That lake's still there today. It wasn't there in 1985. Now we have a lake that if we moved it to the Alps, it would be that big. It would fill everywhere from Milan up to Switzerland. And it wasn't there 30 years ago. So things are changing. Now, here's our first problem. These satellites are measuring light, color, effectively, and water isn't one color. It depends on what's in it and what's under it. So it's a huge challenge to map it globally. Second problem we face is when you look at the planet from space, there's a lot of stuff that isn't water that looks like water. So you have to resolve this confusion. And I work with some very smart people at, at the Joint Research Center who've been capable of doing that. So we've resolved that problem. That leaves us a second problem. We've not got to do this once if we're going to cover the whole planet. We've got to do it three million times to build up that time series, that, that time machine going back 30 years. And that's a big computational task. If we'd had one computer, we'd have to switch that computer on when Charlemagne conquered Saxony in 804 and leave it running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for 1,200 years. There's <laughs> that much computer time. Now, we also work with some pretty smart people at Google's Earth Engine, and they got our expert system to run not on one computer, but on 10,000 computers. So we were able to take all those satellite images and turn them into a unique set of maps, which now include time. So the intensity of the blue, this is a river in India that you can see, the intensity of the blue is directly proportional to the amount of time that that location has been underwater. So if it's bright blue, it's been always, always water for 32 years. Where it's a lighter color, it's been underwater for less time. Because it's digital, we can actually turn that into maps of change. 
So the black areas on the map is where there has been no change over 32 years. The red is where it used to be water, and now it's land. And the green is where it used to be land, and now it's water. And we can compute those changes across the entire planet. And what we find is that the planet, over 32 years, has lost 90,000 square kilometers of lakes and rivers. They've just gone. Now, if you just think for a moment that the European Union has 86,000 square kilometers of permanent lakes and water, we'd lose everything in 32 years. We haven't lost all our water, but other parts of the world have. And when we look at the planet, <coughs> in the global context, we find that most of that loss is concentrated. Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have lost the Aral Sea. Afghanistan and Iran have lost the Hamun wetlands. Iran has lost Lake Urmia. And Iraq is losing all of the lakes around Baghdad. Now, it's not just the scale of the loss, it's the speed of the loss. If we zoom in on the lakes near Baghdad and we look at what it was like in 1985, a full lake. 15 years later, the islands have got a little bigger and the lakes contracted slightly, but not much change. But look what happens in the next 15 years. Between 2000 and 2015, the lake has gone. So it's the speed of the change as well. And of course, that has a massive impact on people's lives. In fact, it has a massive impact on all life. But so too does the inverse, getting more water, increasing water. We tell ourselves we need dams. We need them for the hydroelectric, and we need them for irrigation. But when you build a dam, you change everything. You change everything above where the dam's built and below where the dam's built. And when we look at that on the planetary scale, we do not see the same concentration because many people are building dams. We have our friend Balbina in Brazil, but that's just one of many dams that Brazil has built. US has built dams. Sudan has built dams. Spain has built dams. Turkey has built dams. India has built dams. China has built dams. Canada has built dams. Myanmar has built dams. I could carry on for ages. In total, we might have lost 90,000 square kilometers, but we've gained 184,000 square kilometers. That's twice as much water as has been lost. Effectively, the world is getting wetter. Now, most of that is due to dam building, but not all of it. And on the third pole, the Himalayan plateau, we're finding that all of the lakes are increasing in size because of climate change. Increased snow melt, increased glacier uh, runoff, and every single lake, if we go into the Tibetan plateau, is growing in size. In total, we've lost about 8,000 square kilometers of grazing land, and that's forcing animals away. It's threatening roads. It's threatening villages. It's having a huge impact. So what we're finding is that as we looked at our planet from space, when we first looked at it, we changed the view of the planet forever. But what we've been doing in the last 30 years is measuring the change that we're wreaking on our planet, that we're exerting on our planet. And we have to change the way that we're working. And if we're going to do that, it's got to be based on facts. Now, seeing is believing. And if I sit on this data and hold it to myself, it's not going to help you or anybody else. So, the European Commission's Copernicus program and our friends at Google Earth Engine are making all of these maps and all of the data and all of the statistics available free to everybody. So you can go to this map site and you can see the true beauty of our watery world for yourself. Seeing is believing. You can download the data even. So we're making this data available. We're making it available to scientists. We're making it available to politicians. And we're making it available to you. So go there, look at the maps, and enjoy it. Thank you. Right. So that is the first one. Uh, how I can get rid of this now, here. Oh my.
So this is one of the, the, the global data sets that the European Union is uh, providing, uh, the global surface water, but we have others. There is a global settlement uh, map. This is a particular uh, example of the European success. We have a global steam flow characteristics data set. We have a global land cover. We have uh, an European soil database. And we have even a very imaginative uh, global map of accessibility. And all these uh, maps that I'm showing to you are public. I just guaranteed that there is a download, the download button where you can really get the, the, actual, the actual data. So summarizing what, what we have seen, uh, there, are, there, there are topics uh, about uh, big data the, the emphasis on the changes, and the, the most important thing, at least for the sustainable development goals, this capacity of express granularity, this capacity of tell us exactly where changes are, are happening, not at, the, not at the country level, but uh, of course at a much more resolution level. So uh, the question is, uh, and I, maybe I can recover this also here, because if not, I will be, OK, confused. Uh, the question is, uh, do you remember the examples of the data sets that I have showed to you that are really of these characteristics? Uh, what, which are the limitations of this? What we can do, what we cannot do? It's, it could be easy, then, to cross uh, combine these these data sets and get new new answers so what we can do with uh, with with them no? and uh, in in some sense what is the the value of of what we are contributing uh, to years with uh, with these with these maps uh, which are the barriers to 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 do these analytics with with these maps uh, this is part of the limitations part uh, and do we know that there are some kind of a topics where where it's not haven't been possible yet to to provide a data set like this, uh, and uh, and it could be very useful. And uh, the, there are people already trying to to do something. These are uh, these are my my questions for 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 you. We have uh, maybe uh, ten or uh, fifteen minutes to 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 this discussion. So help me here. Who wants to start? For instance. Uh, you, you are the expert on one of the experts on, on the land, and we have seen that this guy has pro, has produced this uh, not just a map of uh, water coverage. He has produced several of them uh, that allow us to see these changes uh, in time. So, is it is it possible to have a land uh, cover land use? A map like this with this frequency, or there are you know technical limitations where we are uh, limiting us to have one every five years or something uh, like that. Tell me. Okay, you're asking me. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and, and you all understand. Yeah, I don't need the microphone. Well, um, yeah, thanks for the question. I think it's it's very interesting um, to for the first time now seeing this 13 meter type of maps coming out. Um, there are several ones which have been mentioned, so there is the water product, there is the global human settlement layer, and there is now, as we probably know, the CCI uh, product which has been produced from 82, not with um, Landsat though, but with, with other data sets, including ABHR, um, Mary's data, they have been all integrated, but it's the first time that there are now change products coming out, Initially, the easy ones or the easy one are water. The easy one is also human settlement. The more challenging one, the forest maps we've also seen, the yeah. forest change yeah. maps are existing as well. Uh, that's coming out from the University of Maryland. But what is more difficult and more challenging is, is for example, the differentiation between cropland, cropland change uh, versus natural vegetation. That's not still very challenging and has not really been that much addressed. But coming back to this product from CCI, I think it's also the first time that these products are coming out there. There's still a lot of work which needs to be done, and this is the point I want to make. There's still extremely high uncertainty. So mapping is easy. 
Um, and I think what Alan Barrow's group has done in the JSC is extraordinary because the accuracy is really high. But it's easy. It's an easy fit. Already when you move to forest, it becomes already much more challenging because it's also related to risk. It's also related to the definition. But also, um, it's related to many other things, spectral separability, for example. Um, but we have to go there. I think it's a really, really important theme. We have the data. We can theoretically do it. We don't quite have the training data yet. We, we started to look at the accuracy, for example, of these initial products, for, uh, the CCI change map. I think it's a good step forward, but we are not there because um, the change maps themselves, when you look really at change over time, are really not convincing, to be honest, because many things are not represented, such as the massive abandonment which has happened in former Soviet Union is actually not sufficiently captured in these maps. So we have still a lot of work to do on this change mapping on very high resolution, but it's at the same time a big <coughs> opportunity. That's my statement to break the ice, anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, Somebody has something to comment. There's some people from ESA there. There's some other people here um, who might have some thoughts. As as Gunter Schreier from Biela, as we are in the Eurogeos like infancy and being created, etc., etc., uh, what would be the tendency, the bias, to specifically to use European data sets like the central data sets? Or in other words, uh, we have heard from Alan this Landsat history, and unfortunately, unfortunately, USGSF, we don't have the history. We have a little bit with ERS and NVSA, but um, wouldn't we put a specific focus, not like only Europeans, but is there an issue on saying what kind of data sets on this global level we can generate from specifically in future Central 2, Central 1, Central 1 with the history back going to ERS 1? My colleagues do a group as uh, interferometric ground stability map, partly going back to the Euros one days. So is there an issue on this Euro geos and specifically using these European uh of mm -hmm. More a question than a question. Yeah. Yeah, and this, this is related uh, with this idea that uh, if we have to focus on the European dimension or we have some kind of an obligation that since we have the Sentinel constellation, we go for a global uh, products anyway from Europe, stimulated from, from Europe, uh, using the Landsat heritage for compensating this lack of, uh, you know, backwards history, let's just call it that way. Uh, uh, hmm? did, <coughs> did you do also a study, let's say, who is in fact downloading this type of maps for what purpose? And uh, are they uh, researchers? And if they are researchers, are they using for what purposes? Are they informing policy makers? So what's the use of the maps uh, behind downloading them? <coughs> because that, I think, is driving uh, more, uh, let's say, the, the needs on uh, yeah, maybe the policy makers behind them. So what is being done on this area? Yeah, if I may be provocative here, I don't imagine Donald Trump downloading these data sets for decision making himself. <laughs> so, so pro probably there is so, so, some kind of uh, scientific uh, work that needs to be done to translate these data sets into something useful uh, for decision making, I, I believe. Some kind of a summary and uh, s some kind of, a, you, you know, of a change detection. Uh, as as we as we said and, and so on. And this this also links with the next video that I wanted to show you on how to interpret data and how to present data in a way that is easier for to to understand for the decision making. Uh, yeah. yeah, just following your, your remark, it, it is downloading the, the way to go. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a good question too. Yes, because well, there are trends to try to basically send process to where the data are stored. And get back the results. So there's a kind of paradigm. And you will see all the amount of, of, of data that could be available, the size, they are more precise or more bigger than ever. So more details. Will it be worth to download, to have those download capacity rather than changing, having process done and get back the results. It could be something to to meditate. Yeah. 
actually, the, the, the documentary has this emphasis at the beginning on this collaboration with Google that made possible that because of the big data and the difficulties in, in that part, yeah. To follow up on, on this comment, um, yes, it is It is really a question what to do with the data. Do you download that? And I guess it's a massive, it's a massive amount of data that you would need to download. So how long would it take to download that, to process it, to do something meaningful with it? And the other way is, well, to push um, tasks, to push executable code where the data is located yeah. and then enable a particular process to run on that. Now the problem is if you have created such a data map, you don't know what others would need in terms of processing. So what you would, the only thing that you could offer is a kind of a, a processing service or something like a slot yeah, where others can, can plug in and execute things to get things back. So because you don't know what others want, you cannot provide a particular uh, executable task. So you need a system, that's what I'm after at the end of the day, yeah, you need a particular system that allows something like, okay, here is a slot, and trusted applications can plug in here, trusted services can be executed here, but only trusted application and services can hook in, in here, use our resources and process a particular result that is useful for them, so you, you rent your data to be used with a service for a particular purpose for a particular time and you can use your, our computational environment, but we need to trust you. And so the pointer is for tomorrow's session. <laughs> so, so data processing is great, but you also need a system, you need an APIs, you need to specify something in that direction, how to make good and better use of all these maps and all the data sets that are being produced. And I have to say, this is also easier to say when you, you say, I have raw data, I want to produce one of these products, but when you have these products, those are distributed in several different places, mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, do this uh, crossing uh, through themes, it's again a challenge. Yeah. Uh, what, what you describe, I mean, uh, GRC and Elm specifically for this data set as standard with Google Earth Engine, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that what's currently ongoing, partly also motivated by the Amazon and Google Earth Engine or, or Britain, is that also Europe is going to respond with uh, European cloud, uh, DIAs, and all these initiatives. Mm -hmm. Let's see where we finally end up uh, with uh, regard to this. But this is exactly the theme, not just downloading all the data, but offering a platform a trusted platform where you can put your applications, whatever secure or shared with science mm -hmm. it is, uh, merge with other data, but it should be all on the platform. That's right. That's currently ongoing. Maybe ESA colleagues and the European Commission colleagues are, can talk more about this, DIAS, mm -hmm. uh, but also European Science uh, Cloud. So there are several like these mm -hmm. initiatives. Uh, uh, Amanda Regan, I work in our uh, DGRTD, or I'm on secondment from DISA, and I've been involved in the Eurogeos concept paper. Um, just to um, just to say that the idea of Eurogeos is it's the European component to to Geos. First of all, uh, it's not going to be limited to just European data sets. Um, so. Uh, open data sets like Landsat or any others, they can be, we're not going to put an invisible fence around, oh, this is mine, this is from your, you know. So uh, I think we need, uh, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, uh, all available data sets. We're also working with DIAS, with the European uh, uh, Science uh, uh, open, open Data. Um, so we're trying to, to connect all of these, uh, these elements together. And uh, yeah, there'll be more information in the launch event later. Mm -hmm. Thanks. W wonder about different data sets. Uh, I, I don't know what you want to say, but I, w I was thinking about is can we do uh, global things about uh, habitats uh, uh, going beyond <coughs> land cover? That, that's what I mean. But say what you wanted to say first. I can reply to your question. <laughs> 
uh, it's good to have all these data sets, but it's uh, even better if uh, the politicians and the people who are going to use them can trust them. Yes. In order to be able to trust, if I apply methodology to a global level, then this methodology might not be in a specific areas as, ac ac as accurate as it should be for the politicians to take decisions upon. So there are some regional networks already operating, trying to validate here and there the global products. I think it could be nice if we can somehow coordinate, in a sense, all these efforts, because there are publications coming here and there, I have validated here, I have validated there, I found this result. So if we can coordinate this and bring it to a, a kind of centralized database or whatever, so that this data can also be trusted with a specific accuracy percent. In matters of uh, translating one product to the other, there are one to many relations, <coughs> it's not one to one always, and there are many different nomenclatures. And there are some efforts done by the Eagle Group, so far I know, and also by the LCCS, trying to give ways to translate from one to the other, so from habitat, from flat cover categories to habitat categories, and moreover to uh, uh, ecosystem, let's say, uh, services and so on as a, as a prolongation. Yeah, and this is also related with the essential variables work, uh, the vocabularies. The vocabularies are more for maybe what you were talking about were, were more for categories, but in the continuous domain, the essential variables are also things that we are talking about. What, what about uh, what about habitats? Can, can we build uh, a global map about uh, habitats and habitat change detection and ecosystem services and all this stuff? You're asking me? Yeah. It's a very See? provocative question. Of course. Very ambitious <laughs> but uh, through many projects, we are trying to do that for specific reasons and try to understand the functioning behind. Mm -hmm. And this cannot only be solved by the remote sensing per se. Uh, we need the expert of knowledge and we need that the ecologists understand the remote sensing people and that the remote sensing people understand the ecologists to come together to bring this forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just one thing. I think um, if we really want to fully understand globally the degree of biodiversity loss, these kind of change maps of habitats, well, it's basically translating the land cover to a habitat class. And once you do that, you are very close to better understanding the biodiversity loss. Essentially, um, it means to use habitat or land cover information to derive a so-called biodiversity intactness index. So this is basically one way to go where habitat is an input into understanding habitat loss. And if you have 30 meter reliable land cover change information as we have for the water, I think we are very close to much better understand threats and changes in biodiversity, especially with respect to the well-documented ones, which are, which are the birds and the mammals and so on. But um, that's, that's the first step. So I think it's extremely well valuable, those, those change products, of course, taking into account a certain kind of legend cross-working definition take, using the <coughs> Eagle or the LCCS content. I fully agree. Yeah. Let me, uh, in, in the interest of, of moving on, uh, let me do the, even the <coughs> most difficult question. Uh, I will say uh, an acronym, uh, you, and you will say only, maybe only a word or a sentence, a very high resolution. It's an acronym. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the resolution uh, is uh, crucial if you are talking about uh, biodiversity changes in uh, specific areas, such as uh, in the Mediterranean areas, where you cannot use uh, high resolution data. The problem is that uh, uh, now uh, you have uh, regular coverage very high resolution data and this is uh, really a problem for people really interested in uh, habitat um, changes. Mm -hmm. Another problem is uh, the availability of uh, centralized um, in situ data uh, that you need um, to combine or to provide habitat from uh, the covers. And this is I think these are <coughs> issues uh, related to very high resolution data. Mm. But I would like to add something which is related uh, to 
the semantic um, related to changes. It is very difficult for me, or probably unfeasible, to talk about uh, uh, change map, uh, global change map, or a regional change map without defining firstly the questions that we are trying to answer. What kind of change from a, a Lenkover class to another Lenkover class, from an habitat to another habitat, or uh, changes within a specific um, class, both Lenkover, habitat, or other things? Mm -hmm. Without uh, this um, the definition of the specific questions uh, or um, the definition of the semantic related to changes, it is, it is really difficult to provide uh, useful change products. According to me, because you have different uh, stakeholders, different uh, users, and if you are working with, uh, with the ecologists, they say, please, provide me your changes. If you work with uh, the geologists, please, provide me your changes. So it's very difficult to provide mm -hmm. uh, useful um, change now, globally or locally, without uh, relating the products to the question. Yeah. This is a this is a problem of the chicken and egg also. No, you produce a data set uh, to answer a specific question. Then there are others that are trying to to use that data set and combine it to answer other questions. But the the product was not formulated for those questions in the first place. So we have difficulties here. Uh, well, and also going back to the very high resolution, we have this lack of continuity, spatial, temporal, and we have also the cost problem. Uh, on, on very high resolution too. Okay, let, let me move on to the to the to the next uh, uh, video. This is uh, I was kind of fascinated by this video. Uh, uh, I was standing in the, my living room, just you know, on front of the TV. Throw me whatever you want, and uh, I, I saw this this video on the uh, on uh, on the BBC Channel Four, and I really recommend that you look for the full uh, version of it. Uh, but what I wanted to offer you is just a fragment where you will see uh, the history of the hum humanity in the last uh, uh, 200 years, actually the history of 200 countries, explained uh, using only two parameters. And I really love this, this part. But first, let me just... Uh, let me let me just offer you the, the just the start of the video, and that w w that was what how I was amazed by it. Oh my! It's a wash with data that comes pouring in from everywhere around us. On its own, this mm -hmm. data is just noise and confusion. To make sense of data, to find the meaning in it, we need the powerful branch of science, statistics. Believe me, there's nothing boring about statistics, especially not today when we can make the data sing. With statistics, we can really make sense of the world. And there is more. With statistics, the data deluge, as it's being called, is leading us to an ever greater understanding of life on Earth and the universe beyond. And thanks to the incredible power of today's computers, it may fundamentally transform the process of scientific discovery. I kid you not, statistics is now the sexiest subject around. Okay, so going back to the, directly to the, to the fragment of the video that I would like to show you, this is the start just here. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 
400, 4,000, and 40,000 dollars. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Okay, that's it. Uh, I, I was really amazed by several things about uh, this documentary and this fragment in particular. The, the most important thing is it gives us a message of optimism. I was happy after th seeing this graphic. The guy was not only able to show me a lot of details and things that I never thought in that way, it, it, it was even a feeling. Uh, no? So, I mean, the, the question is, can we do the same with Earth observation? We really need guys like this one. But by the way, I, uh, the, the last year, unfortunately. Uh, so we need a replacement. But we need also the Earth observation communication ambassador, maybe. Uh, and also all these summaries. And talking about summaries, I'm offering here 
dashboards. This is a possible way of summarizing things, and these are summaries made by the World Bank. This is not a sp uh, sp this doesn't have a spatial granularity. It's just talking about countries, but uh, it's a very good way of representing the tendencies in the Sustainable Development Goals. Several uh, indicators represented there. You can just see that those. Diagram C if these small uh, island countries uh, are improving or not. Uh, and you can also do maps with this, uh, it's again World Bank data, uh, with this same data and uh, emphasize on the singularities. No? Ecuador uh, is the, the country with more threatened species, uh, or this one that show us. Uh, that uh, for water sanitation, we still have important gaps uh, of uh, no data here and there, apart from being this region the worst. Uh, and for terrestrial protected areas, I managed to see in particular that my country is in good shape about that. Uh, you know, it's very simple representations that help you to communicate uh, that. So this, to me, it's called knowledge extraction. And it's the holy grail of what we are doing here. Uh, we are trying to extract uh, knowledge, and we are trying to communicate this, no this uh, knowledge to, to serve uh, decision making. Uh, so questions to offer to you in the, in the era of the big data. How can Eurogeos improve the extraction of information and knowledge from data? Can the knowledge be also entertainment? Uh, how do we communicate the knowledge? So do we need these uh, Earth Observation Ambassadors that I was talking about? Or do we need to create uh, new visualization tools? Because I have the feeling that the GCI addressed this cooperability, but it's not addressing so well this presentation, this data visualization, this data communication that probably we, we need. Uh, and I know Eurogeos is not about tools, uh, but you know, maybe I can convince that small tools could be <laughs> could be also <laughs> worth to, to take uh, into account. Uh, so I open the floor again for uh, for this caution and uh, also for uh, the the ones, if any, that are following this in streaming. We are also monitoring the YouTube uh, chat window. So if you have something to uh, ask or something to say. Uh, please type it there, and uh, Yvette will will see it immediately. So, who is the, you know, the the guy with uh, uh, that wants to break the ice? Uh, you know, the, the friends are friends are to 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 use them when you need it. Uh, <laughs> so, you 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 have been working on presenting uh, energy. Uh, data in new portals and visualizations, uh, sensor one and so on. I, I don't know. Can, can you tell me something about that just to start? Yes, that's not that easy, but uh, yeah, I think definitely doesn't need to present in better way. So for me, the GCI is there. It's okay. It has show us about, for the past ten years that it has been capable of gathering information. There's a lot of things that has been done regarding the use of standard interoperability <coughs> best practices. We have experimented this in the energy uh, area because we were basically not knowledgeable about this 10 years ago. And, and, and this is a really great amount of work. So now, of course, there's a trend, and this, uh, this is what has been presented here, to do more with those data. So whatever can, can, can be done in order to better present, to better summarize the tremendous work of scientists that has been taking years of gathering data should be of any help. So we have done this doing pilots. I also think that there is not any one size fit all kind of, let's say, magic. So when it comes to talking to your community, you need to have really some precise look and feel kind of, let's say, application that really talk to the people you want to talk to. So. I've been experimenting this many times, so getting rid of those magic of one size fits all, the application that would present all the data <laughs> that in, the, in, the, in the background in a matter of a snap of, a, of fingers. So this is something. And then there are plenty of 
well, the GCI is opening with the API, you know, to facilitate uh, basically the extraction. And I think that whatever could be done in that sense could be could be supported. Now we have really nice, let's say, framework to to extract to present those kind of visualization, taking a bit of uh, let's say um, let's say work regarding how it has been done is a bit uh, sci-fi, but. Having this available on the web with really practical, up to the point message for a given community, really well identified, is definitely the way to go. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, again, I fully support the idea to better visualize and display data. But on the other hand, especially when it comes to statistics, I guess it was also British also who wrote the famous book, How to Lie with Statistics. <laughs> so statistics always has, um, what would I like to achieve with the statistics? So I haven't seen seldom statistics where somebody said, let's do some graphics and find out what the data is, is about. So especially when it comes to visualization. The stuff he has, for instance, told um, is nice, is a positive thing. But if you're going more in, in, in the deep, you can also make a statistic that uh, the, the wealth of the earth is concentrated more and more on many very fewer people where there are more poorer people. So there's other statistics also run. What I'm going to say here, especially when it comes to socioeconomic, and I think geos cannot be divided, only earth observation and environment and the rest doesn't, we don't care about socioeconomic. As, as soon as we enter socioeconomic, you have, you have to have a political opinion somewhere. So we enter, of course, a kind of political arena I, I wouldn't say this is bad. Maybe Eurogeos will have um, the feature that they specifically open for political opinion and socio-economic factors, because maybe others won't or fear to do this. So I think we need to have this combination, but then we have also a, a socio-economic opinion, Euro, maybe European socio-economic opinion about the combination of socio-economics and economy. Because some people say you can't have both, a nice economy and everybody is wealthy. Uh, a nice uh, environment and healthy environment and a growing <coughs> economy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, making the links uh, between uh, the statistics which can lie and the enthusiasm you are very sensitive to, I wonder if you can be so enthusiastic and convince and try to convince others if it's not data that you have built yourself. Can you really uh, be so convinced if, if you um, have to make a study or a presentation based on data which have been pre-processed by other people, or you don't master all the algorithms which have been uh, used? And uh, so this, the question for your audience is uh, how far uh, has the raw data to be available or more uh, processed and value-added products? And this is where the threshold has to be looked for, I think. Yeah. Oh, well, we we are we are seeing the increase in both. I believe we are seeing the increase in, in availability of raw data, and we are seeing the the availability on on value added. Uh, I just wanted to make one more point, which relates a bit to, to what you said. You know, how can we really have impact, and how can we? have also some interest by the policy makers. And I think what policy makers are interested, they want to know something about the past, but what they are primarily worried about is how can I now influence the future. And this relates to the linkage between those observation and modeling. And I think we need to make a real effort to feed more of those observation data into the modeling. And the big advantage of this very high resolution data becoming available high resolution sentinel type of data is that we we manage to track progress towards some political goal. This could be the SDGs or this could be a country level political goal or policy maker has. So we have some objective to probably change something and to make something better in the country. Now we have the tools to see if his policy is actually working. And this relates a lot to making sure that there is a strong neutral linkage between the Earth observation data and the modeling data. And that's not to that degree yet uh, happening, I think. There's a lot of models which still are very traditional and 
they don't bother to use us observation when they, there could be much more integration, I think. And I, I just wanted to make that point. So, um, you know, who are the stakeholders? One of the big stakeholders are policymakers interested in the economy, in GDP growth. If we can show them there is an economic benefit also in taking additional care of their environment, then we get this win-win kind of situation we're talking about what Europe is much worried about and what Europe is stands for, which is green growth. Hmm. Yeah, actually, this, uh, this thing about the models is, uh, is a complicated. It probably it's, it's the, the next step that we have to try. Uh, it, we succeeded in, in, cataloged data, in cataloging data. We succeeded in, in making it accessible. Accessible, there are uh, people that are claiming the next step is the model web. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, I, I, I'm seeing ve uh, a lot of complications. There's, some of them are just practicalities about how to move algorithms to the, the right platform. Others are more conceptual about how you find the actual inputs for those models and, and the sensibility of the models when you change your input. If you design a model to, to use error observation using Landsat, what is the sensibility when you change to Sentinel? Uh, sometimes you have to, to retune your, your model again to, to make it uh, feasible. And, uh, this is probably why you know you need, you really need an expert in the model itself to, to run it. You cannot expect that you put models out there and everybody will be will be able to to make it run. Uh. Yes, I would like to, to give some comment. Uh, in the in your video, what is very convincing is that you have um, you have con you see the animation of the skins continuously with the time and uh, it's more convincing than when the people if you see uh, the, the sequence with uh, all what happened in two hundred years but you see each year and uh, for us observation and considering the impact of the entropic impact on our environment <coughs> It's very important to be able to show right uh, to see this pressure continuously in time. If you if you speak about the urban sprawl or on uh, water resources, if we are able with earth observation to show this impact continuously, it could be very convincing for the people to to and policymakers and. And we have now this opportunity with some final and uh, with us observation to make this diagnosis. It, it, it needs, of course, good experts. We need to have confidence in these experts. But uh, if we are able to show this, uh, some of, of good diagnosis uh, continuously in time, it will be convincing for the people. Yeah. So this is this is actually, uh, I, I believe, a message. Uh, to, to say that in the past, uh, uh, Earth observation satellites were kind of experimental, and you tried your algorithms, you do your best, and once you really have the algorithm, the life of the satellite, uh, it's over, uh, it dies, and it goes away. And, uh, and, and now we have this continuity of some constellations that this is really, this is really an, an, a new opportunity, uh, actually. Yeah? Uh, so here in the, uh, in the chat, uh, there, there, there is a person that is, that is asking the, the question that actually I was also asking. So he is impressed by the visualization tool and he wonders what do we have uh, for uh, consumption of uh, satellite data. The first thing that comes to, to, to my mind is this uh, uh, Sentinel, uh, Sentinel web site that is done by Synergize, I believe it's the name Sentinel of the hub. Sentinel Hub, that is a very user-friendly uh, tool to at least explore uh, this data. But I, I really believe that we need more of those. Uh, tell me. I want to take the discussion to a different perspective. It's good to go for the stakeholders and all these tools are great. Uh, I, I have been involved in last years in bringing Earth observation to younger people. I mean to make them understand 
what is the benefit out of it and connect it to the real education of theirs. So if the people are getting smarter, so this is for us that might not have done something with like an observation in our high school times, but if these people are getting more exposed to such elements, then they would be more willing or they would be more better adapt, adjusted to the reality to make use out of these products. So to that I, I would like to emphasize the EduSpace, sales project and other projects that have run also in national levels. So we have to see also this perspective because this is the communication with the stakeholders that are now, but what about the stakeholders of the future? If yeah. they are more educated, yeah. Yeah. exposed to our topics, and they would be yeah. more willing to accept. Yeah. Actually, uh, actually, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing. I mean, it's a, because I, I, I wonder, uh, you know, if we go back uh, 50 years or so, how many people is really able to understand a graphic like this? So n now it's possible to do a documentary like this, but because everybody is kind of a l literate on, on, on reading graphics, but it wasn't in the past. So we need the same for, for the observation. That's what you are asking for, I believe. Oh, uh, a final comment when I'm getting, getting prepared for the new video. Thank you. You want to leave from Isa? Uh, you are mentioning uh, the, uh, the statistics and earth observations, and uh, we know through the SDGs that uh, the national statistical offices at the moment uh, do not use earth observation data yeah. that much. And uh, maybe there in the framework of the SDG, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals 2030 with indicators, there's uh, an opportunity for your geos to see which indicators you could uh, contribute to. And in addition to the indicators, you know, the custodian agencies from the UN agencies, the custodian of those indicators, are developing methodologies to, uh, in order uh, so to be used by the statistical agencies, national one, in order to create kind of a standardized way of uh, generating those <coughs> indicators. Yeah. We are mentioning uh, the, the accuracy of uh, the accuracy of the results uh, that you, you can generate uh, through uh, uh, like JRC or those two. And maybe uh, also using those methodologies to produce indicators that are requested in the SDGs <coughs> can be also another way to, uh, to be explored. Yeah. And we are kind of a generation generating a transition in the statistical offices that allows them to have this level of granularity uh, that is more detailed than administrative units by using Earth observation. And this this is a thing that is starting now and we we will see the the progress. Uh, just to, just a couple of words, please. Just, just picking up on the point mm -hmm. there, so um, there is a, a UN initiative called Geospatial Information Management, um, and we've done an awful lot of working with the geospatial and statistical organisations bringing it together, and for the Agenda 2030, a lot of work has already gone on to identify which of the indicators <coughs> have geospatial or Earth observation aspects to them. So I can always point you in the right direction of where that research is already and where it's come along. Final remark? Just to remind that uh, Joe is not only uh, producing statistics, but a lot of indicators that help to uh, reach the, the, the statistic of uh, the SDG. Yeah. I mean, we are able to manage the statistics, but there is a lot of things that are behind that, and uh, that's mainly the information that Joe can provide, and then translate it into the statistics. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, I want to apologize for the quality of the, this or the video. Uh, that I'm going to show. It's produced in a more, less sophisticated uh, way. But on the other hand, I found it kind of an interesting. Uh, and it's emphasizing on this data management part. We only have uh, almost 10 minutes left. So let's, uh, let's see that. So let's see if, it, see if, we insp if in it inspires Hello. some discussion too. My name is Dr. Judy Benign. I'm an oncologist at NYU School of Medicine. Hello, Dr. Judy Benign. I read your article on B cell function. I think that I could use the data for my work on pancreatic cancer. I am not an oncologist. I know, but I think I could use the data for my work on pancreatic cancer. Do you have the data? Everything you need to know is in the article. No. What I need is the data. Will you share your data? 
I am not sure that will be possible. But your work is in PubMed Central and was funded by NIH. That is true. And it was published in Science, which requires that you share your data. I did publish in Science. Then I am requesting your data. Can I have a copy of your data? I am not sure where my data is. But surely you saved your data. I did. I saved it on a USB drive. Where is the USB drive? It is in a box. <laughs> it is in a box at home. I just moved. But can I use your data? There are many boxes. So many boxes. I forgot to label the boxes. Hello again. Thank you for sending me a copy of your data on a USB drive. I received the envelope yesterday. You are welcome, but I will need that back when you are finished. That is my only copy. I did have a question. What is your question? You might find the answer in my article. No. I received the data, but when I opened it up, it was in hexadecimal. Yes, that is right. I cannot read hexadecimal. You asked for my data and I gave it to you. I have done what you asked. But is there a way to read the hexadecimal? You will need the program that created the hexadecimal file. Yes, I will. What is the name of the program? Cytosynth. I do not know this program. It was a very good program. The company that made the program went bankrupt in 2007. Do you have a copy of the program? I do not use this program anymore because the company that made it went bankrupt. <laughs> Maybe you can buy a copy on eBay. <laughs> I have good news. You again. I talked to my colleague. She knew a person with a copy of the software. Then why do you need me? Everything you need to know about the data is in the article. I opened the data and I could not understand it. If you have the program, you will find it is clear. Well, I noticed that you called your data fields SAM. Is that an abbreviation? Yes, it is an abbreviation of my co-author's name. His name is Samuel Lee. We called him SAM. I see. And what is the content of the field called SAM1? Ah, yes. SAM1 is the level of CXCR4 expression. And what is the content of the field called SAM2? That is logical if you think about it. What is the content of the field called SAM2? I don't remember. What about SAM3? Is there a guide to the data anywhere? Yes. Of course. It is the article that is published in Science. <laughs> the article does not tell me what the field names mean. Is there any record of what these field names mean? Yes. My co-author knows what the content of SAM2 is and SAM3. And SAM4. Can I talk to your co-author? I'm not sure. I would very much like to talk to your co-author. Well. He was a graduate student. He went back to China two years ago. Can I have his contact information? He is in China. His name is Sam Lee. I think I cannot use your data. You could check the article to see if what you need is there. Please stop talking now. <laughs> uh, it is really good. It's a nightmare. And actually, it happens very often. Uh, that, is, that, that is exactly the problem. Uh, maybe it's not so often in the earth observation because we learn some lessons, but in the in situ could be particularly <laughs> dramatic. <laughs> now, it's, it's talking about uh, using data for other purposes in the beginning. It's talking about metadata and these. Uh, I forgot to level the boxes. Uh, and uh, it, it is talking about open formats and uh, not using, uh, well, or at least translating your data into something that could be open in the future. And in the, the last part, of course, it was talking about semantics. Uh, so uh, you all know that we have data management principles. 
and these data management principles are supposed to protect us from these nightmares. Uh, so we have things about discoverability, accessibility, usability, preservation, and uh, curation. So we have uh, seven minutes to discuss a little bit about uh, do you know about data that has the risk to getting lost, like this one? Uh, what about uh, access issues? What about uh, interpretation of the data, so semantics? What about data quality? Uh, and uh, what EuroGS can do to improve this situation? Can we connect the, this world of the analytics and results and publications with the, the data better in the way that when you have the publication, you also have access to the data and the reproducibility and all this stuff. And finally, what we can do uh, from the EuroGEOS point of view to implement the data management principles in Europe. So let's start by, by asking you if you had this nightmare in the past. Maybe you have it with the elder, uh, you, you know, the sides and the... <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my statement is that, that I think the problems uh, have all been addressed in, in recent uh, Horizon 2020 and other projects. And I think several communities <coughs> have started doing substantive work, actually, to, to fight the issues addressed in the video. So for me, it's kind of, uh, if, if I had seen it, seen it six years before or eight years before, I, I would have said, well, let's do a project about that. <laughs> For the time being, there are excellent examples uh, how most of these problems can be avoided. Uh, and there is an increasing number of very good services. And what remains to me is uh, kind of a, a double aspect. I think we still have a lot of work to do in terms of educating people into a new working culture. Uh, and the political angle to that is as long as we don't have proper incentives for also academic careers uh, to support uh, their careers are supported by proper data documentation and provisioning of data, uh, we will still have a continued with these educational issues. So from my point of view, there is a vicious circle, but technically, I, I'm totally convinced that we don't have much of an issue. Mm -hmm. Most so of what it needs technically is in place or, or in a very, very, very advanced stage to it. Okay. That's, um, and there will be a presentation about that in the webinar. Okay. I, I agree. It's a mindset issue. It's the guy who writes a science article is praised, and the guy who cares for the data is nothing. That's it. It's forgotten. So, it's, uh, so scientists, and it's also large scale research facilities as DLR, tend to be driven by peer-reviewed citation index and not by how you care for, for your data. That's uh, nice, but it's not valued, or uh, sometimes in some cases not valued. So you have to change a little bit of perspective. Yeah, and uh, even the publication the publication industry is trying to change that uh, in the good direction, I, I, I believe. Yeah, just for about this prediction industry recently, we have been asked to provide DOI not only for, let's say, citation for the article, but DOI regarding in-situ measurement data set that we use, we've used in our article. So basically, you need to refer to uh, this kind of process. And we have, uh, so we have, uh, let's say, developed and installed a DOI mechanism in order to be bind with a, a catalog. We operate a catalog, geo network, what you name it. And basically, we create landing page and DOI automatically. It's a good addition for scientists to make sure that now journal and publisher want to have access to the data set that you use in order to claim what you claim in your article. So this is also, as, as you say, you mentioned in a good direction as it is push, pushed by uh, uh, journals and uh, the article industry. Mm -hmm. There was another hand here. Yeah, yeah thank you. Just, just one more point on this issue of having um, kind of more access to data, but also at the same time acknowledging people more who produce data. I think this is now happening since, for example, Nature has this journal called Scientific Data. A lot of things are changing. This is a game changer, I think, because for the first time now you will get acknowledged to some degree 
still not to the same degree as when you, I agree, when you publish in science, but it's increasingly happening that the person who produces data is acknowledged by that. So that's a really important and good development, and there should be more of those data journals following the kind of nature data example. The second worry I have is actually around the quality, and that's also mentioned here. I think we're still not quite there in peer reviewing uh, uh, quality. So we are good in peer reviewing an article because it's easy, but peer, peer reviewing the quality of data is really, really important and very, very challenging. So we usually use an accuracy <coughs> matrix for lots of things, the traditional error matrix, but we know that that just tells you and the overall accuracy, but we don't know where the problems are. That, that's just one example, and I think there needs to be more effort in really engaging more in peer-reviewed data quality control. I think it's, it's essential. Mm -hmm. There is a tendency recently that goes to build up uh, confidence levels of the interpreters of the data. So we are applying at least my work, we have applied uh, some levels, for example, somebody interpreting a feed, so I'm pretty sure it is like that, I'm so and so sure, so I'm not so sure, but I point it as such. So these levels can be introduced in the accuracy assessment and generate also weighted accuracy assessment tables, or also we can speak of uh, uncertainty handling with other ways, but I think this is the right direction to go. Mm -hmm. Maybe the final remark, because we are... Okay. Uh, we have to transition to the other. refer to the first question, if the data at risk of being lost and what your users could do to improve the situation. I would like to bring the experience of another geo project, the geo Creo, that uh, we have uh, run an inventory, let's say, trying to find, find out what are the different uh, data repositories existing in several regions. Uh, I mean, not only Europe, but uh, North Africa, Middle East, Balkans, and so on. And we identified more than 54 uh, uh, portals providing uh, uh, really uh, useful and in this, most of the cases open data, uh, which of course it's not uh, sure if they will continue sustaining their operations in the future, so it's uh, most probable there is a high risk there of this data to be lost. So what we could and what we started doing in our project is to require these uh, portals to be registered into the GIRS, into the GCI platform, so that they will continue their operation, they continue providing data to the user community. And of course, I imagine that you users will to, uh, continue playing this role into the engagement of more portals, and even the ones that uh, would have already identified as to be registered and continue their operations through a more common platform that, that's GCI. That mm -hmm. So this is my view. Yeah, so being part of GEOS is, is a stimulus to to improve this sustainability of the, the portals. Okay, I would like to thank you, uh, everybody, for uh, helping uh, me on uh, having a good session here. I want to apologize for the people that I pointed to start the discussions and, and so on, but you know, friends are to, to use them, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, the discussions about the Rosiers continues just right now with the with the research infrastructure's point of view, uh, and finally, again, uh, by the end of the the uh, day with the Eurogeos uh, launch event. So thanks everybody for for this uh, interesting session. I will I will distribute the notes that I have here using my. Uh, uh, blue pen printer. Thanks to you. <laughs>